9. March 1975. He was sitting on his back stoop. It was 1.30 in the afternoon. The day was hazy and hot. Brush fires far to the west tinged the air with an autumnal smell that jagged oddly against the calendar. If the boy was coming, he would be here in another hour. But the boy didn't always come now. Instead of seven days a week, he came sometimes only four times or five. An intuition had grown in him little by little, and his intuition told him that the boy was having troubles of his own. Perhaps, Dusander thought, the boy was having troubles with his studies, or bad dreams, or both. That last made him smile. Dusander had certainly been afflicted with problems of his own. For three weeks or so he had worn the SS uniform to bed like grotesque pajamas, and the uniform had warded off the insomnia and the bad dreams. His sleep had been, at first, as sound as a lumberjack's. Then the dreams had returned, not little by little, but all at once and worse than ever before. Dreams of running, as well as the dreams of the eyes. Running through a wet, unseen jungle where heavy leaves and damp fronds struck his face, leaving trickles that felt like sap or blood. Running and running, the luminous eyes always around him, peering soullessly at him until he broke into a clearing. In the darkness he sensed rather than saw the steep rise that began on the clearing's far side. At the top of that rise was Patton, its low cement buildings and yards surrounded by barbed wire and electrified wire, its sentry towers standing like Martian dreadnoughts straight out of War of the Worlds, and in the middle, huge stacks billowed smoke against the sky, and below these brick columns were the furnaces, stoked and ready to go, glowing in the night like the eyes of fierce demons. They had told the inhabitants of the area that the Patton inmates made clothes and candles, and of course the locals had believed that no more than the locals around Auschwitz had believed that the camp was a sausage factory. It didn't matter. Looking back over his shoulder in the dream, he would at last see them coming out of hiding, the restless dead, the Juden, shambling toward him with blue numbers glaring from the livid flesh of their outstretched arms, their hands hooked into talons, their faces no longer expressionless, but animated with hate. Lively with vengeance, vivacious with murder. Toddlers ran beside their mothers and grandfathers, were borne up by their middle-aged children, and the dominant expression on all their faces was desperation. Desperation? Yes. Because in the dreams he knew, and so did they, that if he could climb the hill, he would be safe. Down here in these wet and swampy lowlands, in this jungle where the night-flowering plants extruded blood instead of sap, he was a hunted animal, prey. But up there he was in command. If this was a jungle, then the camp at the top of the hill was a zoo. All the wild animals safely in cages, he the head keeper whose job it was to decide which would be fed, which would live, which would be handed over to the vivisectionists, which would be taken to the knackers in the remover's van. He would begin to run up the hill, running in all the slowness of nightmare. He would feel the first skeletal hands close about his neck, feel their cold and stinking breath, smell their decay, hear their bird-like cries of triumph as they pulled him down, with salvation not only in sight but almost at hand. At Patton there had never been a contraband problem. Some of the prisoners came with their valuables poked far up their asses in small chamois bags, and how often their valuables turned out not to be valuable at all, photographs, locks of hair, fake jewelry, often pushed up with sticks until they were past the point where even the long fingers of the trusty they had called stinky thumbs could reach. One woman, he remembered, had had a small diamond. Flawed, it turned out, really not valuable at all, but it had been in her family for six generations, passed from mother to eldest daughter, 
or so she said, but of course she was a Jew and all of them lied. She swallowed it before entering Patin. When it came out in her waist, she swallowed it again. She kept doing this, although eventually the diamond began to cut her insides and she bled. There had been other ruses, although most only involved petty items such as a hoard of tobacco or a hair ribbon or two. It didn't matter. In the room Dusanda used for prisoner interrogations, there was a hot plate and a homely kitchen table covered with a red checked cloth, much like the one in his own kitchen. There was always a pot of lamb stew bubbling mellowly away on that hot plate. When contraband was suspected, and when was it not, a member of the suspected clique would be brought to that room. Dusander would stand them by the hot plate, where the rich fumes from the stew wafted. Gently he would ask them, Who? Who is hiding gold? Who is hiding jewelry? Who has tobacco? Who gave the Givinet woman the pill for her baby? Who? The stew was never specifically promised, but always the aroma eventually loosened their tongues. Of course, a truncheon would have done the same, or a gun barrel jammed into their filthy crotches, but the stew was... was elegant, yes. He had found a way of propitiating his nightmare. It was, in a way, no more than wearing the SS uniform, but raised to a greater power. Dusander was pleased with himself, only sorry that he had never thought of it before. He supposed he had the boy to thank for this new method of quieting himself, for showing him that the key to the past's terrors was not in rejection, but in contemplation, and even something like a friend's embrace. It was true that before the boy's unexpected arrival last summer, he hadn't had any bad dreams for a long time. But he believed now that he had come to a coward's terms with his past. He had been forced to give up a part of himself. Now he had reclaimed it. He had bought these gloves in the supermarket. He had stood in the express lane, and older women had looked at him approvingly, even speculatively. The gloves were advertised on TV. They had cuffs. They were so flexible you could pick up a dime while you were wearing them. He took the sack down the cellar. The cellar floor had never been cemented. Shortly, Dusander came back up. He sprayed the kitchen with glade until it reeked of artificial pine scent. He opened all the windows. He washed the barbecue fork and hung it up on the pegboard. Then he sat down to wait and see if the boy would come. He smiled and smiled. Todd did come, about five minutes after Dusander had given up on him for the afternoon. He was wearing a warm-up jacket with his school colors on it. He was also wearing a San Diego Padres baseball cap. He carried his school books under his arms. Yucca ducka, he said, coming into the kitchen and wrinkling his nose. What's that smell? It's awful. I tried the oven, Dusander said, lighting a cigarette. I'm afraid I burned my supper. I had to throw it out. One day later that month, the boy came much earlier than usual, long before school usually let out. Dusander was sitting in the kitchen, drinking ancient age bourbon from a chipped and discolored cup that had the words, Here's your coffee, ma, ha, 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 written around the rim. He had his rocker out in the kitchen now, and he was just drinking and rocking, rocking and drinking, bumping his slippers on the faded linoleum. He was pleasantly high. There had been no more bad dreams at all until just last night, not since the tomcat with the chewed ears. Last night's had been particularly horrible, though. That could not be denied. They had dragged him down after he had gotten halfway up the hill, and they had begun to do unspeakable things to him before he was able to wake himself up. Yet after his initial thrashing return to the world of real things, he had been confident. He could end the dreams whenever he wished. Perhaps a cat would not be enough this time, but there was always the dog pound. Yes, always the pound. Todd came abruptly into the kitchen, his face pale and shiny and strained. He had lost weight, all right, Dusander thought, and there was a queer white look in his eyes that Dusander did not like at all. 
You're going to help me, Todd said suddenly and defiantly. Really? Dusanda said mildly, but sudden apprehension leaped inside of him. He didn't let his face change as Todd slammed his books down on the table with a sudden vicious overhand stroke. One of them spun, skated across the oilcloth, and landed in a tent on the floor by Dusander's foot. Yes, you're fucking a right, Todd said shrilly. You better believe it, because this is your fault. All your fault. Hectic spots of red mounted into his cheeks. But you're going to have to help me get out of it, because I've got the goods on you. I've got you right where I want you. I'll help you in any way I can, Dusander said quietly. He saw that he had folded his hands neatly in front of himself without even thinking about it, just as he had once done. He leaned forward in the rocker until his chin was directly over his folded hands, as he had once done. His face was calm and friendly and inquiring. None of his growing apprehension showed. Sitting just so, he could almost imagine a pot of lamb stew simmering on the stove behind him. Tell me what the trouble is. This is the fucking trouble, Todd said viciously and threw a folder at Dusander. It bounced off his chest and landed in his lap, and he was momentarily surprised by the heat of the anger which leaped up in him, the urge to rise and backhand the boy smartly. Instead, he kept the mild expression on his face. It was the boy's school card, he saw, although the school seemed to be at ridiculous pains to hide the fact Instead of a school card or a grade report, it was called a quarterly progress report. He grunted at that and opened the card. A typed half-sheet of paper fell out. Dusander put it aside for later examination and turned his attention to the boy's grades first. You seem to have fallen on the rocks, my boy, Dusander said, not without some pleasure. The boy had passed only English and American history. Every other grade was an F. It's not my fault, Todd hissed venomously. It's your fault. All those stories. I have nightmares about them, do you know that? I sit down and open my books and I start thinking about whatever you told me that day and the next thing I know my mother's telling me it's time to go to bed. Well, that's not my fault. It isn't. You hear me? It isn't. I hear you very well. Dusander said, and read the typed note that had been tucked into Todd's card. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Bowden, This note is to suggest that we have a group conference concerning Todd's second and third quarter grades. In light of Todd's previous good work in this school, his current grades suggest a specific problem which may be affecting his academic performance in a deleterious way. Such a problem can often be solved by a frank and open discussion. I should point out that although Todd has passed the half-year, his final grades may be failing in some cases unless his work improves radically in the fourth quarter. Failing grades would entail summer school to avoid being kept back and causing a major scheduling problem. I must also note that Todd is in the college division and that his work so far this year is far below college acceptance levels. It is also below the level of academic ability assumed by the SAT tests. Please be assured that I am ready to work out a mutually convenient time for us to meet. In a case such as this, earlier is usually better. Sincerely yours, Edward French. Who is this Edward French? Dusanda asked, slipping the note back inside the card. Part of him still marveled at the American love of jargon, such a rolling missive to inform the parents that their son was flunking out, and then refolding his hands. His premonition of disaster was stronger than ever, but he refused to give in to it. A year before he would have done, a year ago, he had been ready for disaster. Now he was not, but it seemed that the cursed boy had brought it to him anyway. Is he your headmaster? Rubber Ed? Hell no, he's the guidance counselor. Guidance counselor? What is that? You can figure it out, Todd said. He was nearly hysterical. You read the goddamn note. He walked rapidly around the room, shooting sharp, quick glances at Dusander. Well, I'm not going to let any of this shit go down. I'm just not. I'm not going to any summer school. My dad and mom are going to Hawaii this summer, and I'm going with them. He pointed at the card on the table. Do you know what my dad will do if he sees that? 
Dusander shook his head. He'll get everything out of me. Everything. He'll know it was you. It couldn't be anything else because nothing else has changed. He'll poke and pry and he'll get it all out of me. And then, then I'll, I'll be in Dutch. He stared at Dusander resentfully. They'll watch me. Hell, he might make me see a doctor. I don't know. How should I know? But I'm not getting in Dutch and I'm not going to any fucking summer school. Or to the reformatory, Dusander said. He said it very quietly. Todd stopped circling the room. His face became very still. His cheeks and forehead, already pale, became even whiter. He stared at Dusander and had to try twice before he could speak. What? What did you just say? My dear boy, Dusander said, assuming an air of great patience. For the last five minutes, I have listened to you puel and whine. And what all your puling and whining comes down to is this. You are in trouble. You might be found out. You might find yourself in adverse circumstances. Seeing that he had the boy's complete attention at last, Dusander sipped reflectively from his cup. My boy, he went on, that is a very dangerous attitude for you to have. And dangerous for me. The potential harm is much greater for me. You worry about your school card. Pah! This for your school card, he flicked it off the table and onto the floor with one yellow finger. I am worried about my life. Todd did not reply. He simply went on looking at Dusander with that white-eyed, slightly crazed stare. The Israelis will not scruple at the fact that I am seventy-six. The death penalty is still very much in favor over there, you know, especially when the man in the dock is a Nazi war criminal associated with the camps. You're a U.S. citizen, Todd said. America wouldn't let them take you. I read up on that. I You read, but you don't listen. I am not a U.S. citizen. My papers came from La Cosa Nostra. I would be deported, and Mossad agents would be waiting for me wherever I deplaned. I wish they would hang you, Todd muttered, curling his hands into fists and staring down at them. I was crazy to get mixed up with you in the first place. No doubt, Dusander said and smiled thinly. But you are mixed up with me. We must live in the present, boy, not in the past of I should have nevers. You must realize that your fate and my own are now inextricably entwined. If you blow the horn on me, as your saying goes, do you think I will hesitate to blow the horn on you? Seven hundred thousand died at Patin. To the world at large I am a criminal, a monster, even the butcher your scandal rags would have me. You are an accessory to all of that, my boy. You have criminal knowledge of an illegal alien, but you have not reported it. And if I am caught, I will tell the world all about you. When the reporters put their microphones in my face, it will be your name I'll repeat over and over again. Todd Bowden. Yes, that is his name. How long? Almost a year. He wanted to know everything. All the gooshy parts. That's how he put it, yes. All the gooshy parts. Todd's breath had stopped. His skin appeared transparent. Dusander smiled at him. He sipped bourbon. I think they will put you in jail. They may call it a reformatory or a correctional facility. There may be a fancy name for it, like this quarterly progress report, his lip curled. But no matter what they call it, there will be bars on the windows. Todd wet his lips. I call you a liar. I tell them I just found out they believe me, not you. You just better remember that. Dusander's thin smile remained. I thought you told me your father would get it all out of you. Todd spoke slowly, as a person speaks when realization and verbalization occur simultaneously. Maybe not. Maybe not this time. This isn't just breaking a window with a rock. 
Dusander winced inwardly. He suspected that the boy's judgment was right. With so much at stake, he might indeed be able to convince his father. After all, when faced with such an unpleasant truth, what parent would not want to be convinced? Perhaps, perhaps not. But how are you going to explain all those books you had to read to me because poor Mr. Denker is half blind? My eyes are not what they were, but I can still read fine print with my spectacles. I can prove it. I'd say you fooled me. Will you? And what reason will you be able to give for my fooling? For, for friendship, because you were lonely. That, Dusanda reflected, was just close enough to the truth to be believable. And once, in the beginning, the boy might have been able to bring it off. But now he was ragged. Now he was coming apart in strings like a coat that has reached the end of its useful service. If a child shot off his cap pistol across the street, this boy would jump into the air and scream like a girl. Your school card will also support my side of it, Dusanda said. It was not Robinson Crusoe that caused your grades to fall down so badly, my boy, was it? Shut up, why don't you? Just shut up about it. No, Dusanda said. I won't shut up about it. He lit a cigarette, scratching the wooden match alight on the gas oven door. Not until I make you see the simple truth. We are in this together. Sink or swim. He looked at Todd through the raftering smoke, not smiling, his old, lined face reptilian. I will drag you down, boy. I promise you that. If anything comes out, everything will come out. That is my promise to you. Todd stared at him sullenly and didn't reply. Now, Dusander said briskly, with the air of a man who has put a necessary unpleasantness behind him, the question is, what are we going to do about this situation? Have you any ideas? This will fix the report card, Todd said, and took a new bottle of ink eradicator from his jacket pocket. About that fucking letter, I don't know. Dusander looked at the ink eradicator approvingly. He had falsified a few reports of his own in his time, when the quotas had gone up to the point of fantasy and far, far beyond. And, more like the situation they were now in, there had been the matter of the invoices, those which enumerated the spoils of war. Each week he would check the boxes of valuables, all of them to be sent back to Berlin in special train cars that were like big safes on wheels. On the side of each box was a manila envelope, and inside the envelope there had been a verified invoice of that box's contents. So many rings, necklaces, chokers. Dusander, however, had had his own box of valuables. Not very valuable valuables, but not insignificant either. Jades, tourmalines, opals, a few flawed pearls, industrial diamonds. And when he saw an item invoiced for Berlin that caught his eye or seemed a good investment... He would remove it, replace it with an item from his own box, and use ink eradicator on the invoice, changing their item for his. He had developed into a fairly expert forger, a talent that had come in handy more than once after the war was over. Good, he told Todd. As for this other matter... Dusander began to rock again, sipping from his cup. Todd pulled a chair up to the table and began to go to work on his report card, which he had picked up from the floor without a word. Dusander's outward calm had had its effect on him, and now he worked silently, his head bent studiously over the card, like any American boy who has set out to do the best by God job he can, whether that job be planting corn, pitching a no-hitter in the Little League World Series, or forging grades on his report card. Dusander looked at the nape of his neck, lightly tanned and cleanly exposed between the fall of his hair and the round neck of his T-shirt. His eyes drifted from there to the top counter drawer where he kept the butcher knives. One quick thrust. He knew where to put it. And the boy's spinal cord would be severed. His lips would be sealed forever. Dusander smiled regretfully. There would be questions asked if the boy disappeared, too many of them, some directed at him. Even if there was no letter with a friend, close scrutiny was something he could not afford. Too bad. 
This man, French, he said, tapping the letter. Does he know your parents in a social way? Him? Todd edged the word with contempt. My mom and dad don't go anywhere that he could even get in. Has he ever met them in his professional capacity? Has he ever had conferences with them before? No, I've always been near the top of my classes until now. So what does he know about them, Dusander said, looking dreamily into his cup which was now nearly empty. Oh, he knows about you. He no doubt has all the records on you that he can use. Back to the fights you had in the kindergarten play yard. But what does he know about them? Todd put his pen and the small bottle of ink eradicator away. Well, he knows their names, of course. And their ages, he knows we're all Methodists. You don't have to fill that line out, but my folks always do. We don't go much, but he'd know that's what we are. He must know what my dad does for a living. That's on the forms, too. All that stuff they have to fill out every year, and I'm pretty sure that's all. Would he know if your parents were having troubles at home? What's that supposed to mean? Dusander tossed off the last of the bourbon in his cup. Squabbles, fights, your father sleeping on the couch, your mother drinking too much. His eyes gleamed. A divorce brewing. Indignantly, Todd said, There's nothing like that going on. No way. I never said there was. But just think, boy. Suppose that things at your house were going to hell in a streetcar, as the saying is. Todd only looked at him, frowning. You would be worried about them, Toussaint said. Very worried. You would lose your appetite. You would sleep poorly. Saddest of all... Your schoolwork would suffer. True? Very sad for the children when there are troubles in the home. Understanding dawned in the boy's eyes. Understanding and something like dumb gratitude. Dusanda was gratified. Yes, it is an unhappy situation when a family totters on the edge of destruction. Dusander said grandly, pouring more bourbon. He was getting quite drunk. The daytime television dramas, they make this absolutely clear. There is acrimony, backbiting, and lies. Most of all, there is pain. Pain, my boy. You have no idea of the hell your parents are going through. They are so swallowed up by their own troubles that they have little time for the problems of their own son. His problems seem minor compared to theirs, eh? Some day, when the scars have begun to heal, they will no doubt take a fuller interest in him once again. But now, the only concession they can make is to send the boy's kindly grandfather to Mr. French. Todd's eyes had been gradually brightening to a glow that was nearly fervid. Might work, he was muttering. Might, yeah, might work, might... He broke off suddenly. His eyes darkened again. No, it won't. You don't look like me, not even a little bit. Rubber Ed will never believe it. Himmel! Gott im Himmel! Dusanda cried, getting to his feet, crossing the kitchen a bit unsteadily, opening the cellar door and pulling out a fresh bottle of ancient age. He spun off the cap and poured liberally. For a smart boy, you are such a doomkopf. When do grandfathers ever look like their grandsons? Ah, huh? I got white hair. Do you have white hair? Approaching the table again, he reached out with surprising quickness, snatched an abundant handful of Todd's blonde hair and pulled briskly. Cut it out, Todd snapped. But he smiled a little. Besides, Dusander said, settling back into his rocker, you have yellow hair and blue eyes. My eyes are blue, and before my hair turned white, it was yellow. You can tell me your whole family history, your aunts and uncles, the people your father works with, your mother's little hobbies. I will remember. I will study and remember. Two days later, it will all be forgotten again. These days, my memory is like a cloth bag filled with water, but I will remember for long enough. He smiled grimly. 
In my time I have stayed ahead of Wiesenthal and pulled the wool over the eyes of Himmler himself. If I cannot fool one American public school teacher, I will pull my winding shroud around me and crawl down into my grave. Maybe, Todd said slowly. And Dusander could see he had already accepted it. His eyes were luminous with relief. No, surely, Dusander cried. He began to cackle with laughter, the rocking chair squeaking back and forth. Todd looked at him, puzzled and a little frightened, but after a bit he began to laugh too. In Dusander's kitchen they laughed and laughed. Dusander by the open window where the warm California breeze wafted in, and Todd rocked back on the rear legs of his kitchen chair so that its back rested against the oven door, the white enamel of which was crisscrossed by the dark, charred-looking streaks made by Dusander's wooden matches as he struck them alight. Rubber Ed French, his nickname, Todd had explained to Dusander, referred to the rubbers he always wore over his sneakers during wet weather, was a slight man who made an affectation of always wearing keds to school. It was a touch of informality which he thought would endear him to the 106 children between the ages of 12 and 14 who made up his counseling load. He had five pairs of keds, ranging in color from fast-track blue to screaming yellow zonkers, totally unaware that behind his back he was known not only as Rubber Ed, but as Sneaker Pete and the Ked Man as in the Ked Man Cometh. He had been known as Pucker in college, and he would have been most humiliated of all to learn that even that shameful fact had somehow gotten out. He rarely wore ties, preferring turtleneck sweaters. He had been wearing these ever since the mid-sixties when David McCallum had popularized them in The Man from Uncle. In his college days, his classmates had been known to spy him crossing the quad and remark, "'Here comes Pucker in his uncle's sweater,' He had majored in educational psychology, and he privately considered himself to be the only good guidance counselor he had ever met. He had real rapport with his kids. He could get right down to it with them. He could rap with them and be silently sympathetic if they had to do some shouting and kick out the jams. He could get into their hang-ups because he understood what a bummer it was to be 13 when someone was doing a number on your head and you couldn't get your shit together. The thing was, he had a damned hard time remembering what it had been like to be 13 himself. He supposed that was the ultimate price you had to pay for growing up in the 50s. That and traveling into the brave new world of the 60s nicknamed Pucker. Now, as Todd Bowden's grandfather came into his office, closing the pebbled glass door firmly behind him, Rubber Ed stood up respectfully, but was careful not to come around his desk to greet the old man. He was aware of his sneakers. Sometimes the old-timers didn't understand that the sneakers were a psychological aid with kids who had teacher hang-ups, which was to say that some of the older folks couldn't get behind a guidance counselor and kids. This is one fine-looking dude, Rubber Ed thought. His white hair was carefully brushed back. His three-piece suit was spotlessly clean. His dove-gray tie was impeccably knotted. In his left hand, he held a furled black umbrella. Outside, a light drizzle had been falling since the weekend, in a manner that was almost military. A few years ago, Rubber Ed and his wife had gone on a Dorothy Sayers jag reading everything by that estimable lady that they could lay their hands upon. It occurred to him now that this was her brainchild, Lord Peter Whimsey, to the life. It was Whimsey at seventy-five, years after both Bunter and Harriet Vane had passed on to their rewards. He made a mental note to tell Sandra about this when he got home. Mr. Bowden, he said respectfully and offered his hand. A pleasure, Bowden said, and shook it. Rubber Ed was careful not to put on the firm and uncompromising pressure he applied to the hands of the fathers he saw. It was obvious from the gingerly way the old boy offered it that he had arthritis. A pleasure, Mr. French, Bowden repeated, and took a seat, carefully pulling up the knees of his trousers. He propped the umbrella between his feet and leaned on it, looking like an elderly, extremely urbane vulture that had come in to roost in Rubber Ed French's office. He had the slightest touch of an accent, Rubber Ed thought, 
But it wasn't the clipped intonation of the British upper class as Whimsy's would have been. It was broader, more European. Anyway, the resemblance to Todd was quite striking, especially through the nose and the eyes. I'm glad you could come, Rubber Ed told him, resuming his own seat. Although in these cases the student's mother or father... This was the opening gambit, of course. Almost ten years of experience in the counseling business had convinced him that when an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent showed up for a conference, it usually meant trouble at home. The sort of trouble that invariably turned out to be the root of the problem. To Robert Ed, this came as a relief. Domestic problems were bad, but for a boy of Todd's intelligence, a heavy drug trip would have been much, much worse. Yes, of course. Bowden said, managing to look both sorrowful and angry at the same time. My son and his wife asked me if I could come and talk this sorry business over with you, Mr. French. Todd is a good boy, believe me. This trouble with his school marks is only temporary. Well, we all hope so, don't we, Mr. Bowden? Smoke if you like. It's supposed to be off-limits on school property, but I'll never tell. Thank you. Mr. Bowden took a half-crushed package of camel cigarettes from his inner pocket, put one of the last two zigzagging smokes in his mouth, found a diamond blue-tip match, scratched it on the heel of one black shoe, and lit up. He coughed an old man's dank cough over the first drag, shook the match out, and put the blackened stump into the ashtray Rubberhead had produced. Rubberhead watched this ritual, which seemed almost as formal as the old man's shoes, with frank fascination. Where to begin, Bowden said, his distressed face looking at Rubber Ed through a swirling raft of cigarette smoke. Well, Rubber Ed said kindly, the very fact that you're here instead of Todd's parents tells me something, you know. Yes, I suppose it does. Very well. He folded his hands. The camel protruded from between the second and third fingers of his right he straightened his back and lifted his chin. There was something almost Prussian in his mental coming to terms, Rubber Ed thought. Something that made him think of all those war movies he'd seen as a kid. My son and daughter-in-law are having troubles in their home, Bowden said, biting off each word precisely. Rather bad troubles, I should think. His eyes... Old but amazingly bright, watched as Rubber Ed opened the folder centered in front of him on the desk plotter. There were sheets of paper inside, but not many. And you feel that these troubles are affecting Todd's academic performance? Bowden leaned forward, perhaps six inches. His blue eyes never left Rubber Ed's brown ones. There was a heavily charged pause, and then Bowden said, The mother drinks. He resumed his former ramrod straight position. Oh, Rubber Ed said. Yes, Bowden replied, nodding grimly. The boy has told me that he has come home on two occasions and has found her sprawled out on the kitchen table. He knows how my son feels about her drinking problem, and so the boy has put dinner in the oven himself on these occasions and has gotten her to drink enough black coffee so she will at least be awake when Richard comes home. That's bad, Rubber Ed said, although we had heard worse. Mothers with heroin habits, fathers who had abruptly taken it into their heads to start banging their daughters or their sons. Has Mrs. Bowden thought about getting professional help for her problem? The boy has tried to persuade her that that would be the best course. She is much ashamed, I think. If she was given a little time, he made a gesture with his cigarette that left a dissolving smoke ring in the air. You understand? Yes, of course, Rubber had nodded, privately admiring the gesture that had produced the smoke ring. Your son, Todd's father, he is not without blame. Bowden said harshly. The hours he works, the meals he has missed, the nights when he must leave, suddenly I tell you, Mr. French, he is more married to his job than he is to Monica. I was raised to believe that a man's family came before everything. Was it not the same for you? It sure was, Rubber Ed responded heartily. 
His father had been a night watchman for a large Los Angeles department store, and he had really only seen his pop on weekends and vacations. That is another side of the problem, Bowden said. Rubberhead nodded and thought for a moment. What about your other son, Mr. Bowden? Uh, he looked down at the folder. Harold, Todd's uncle. Harry and Deborah are in Minnesota now, Bowden said quite truthfully. He has a position there at the university medical school. It would be quite difficult for him to leave and very unfair to ask him. His face took on a righteous cast. Harry and his wife are quite happily married. I see. Rubberhead looked at the file again for a moment and then closed it. Mr. Bowden, I appreciate your frankness. I'll be just as frank with you. Thank you, Bowden said stiffly. We can't do as much for our students in the counseling area as we would like. There are six counselors here, and we're each carrying a load of over a hundred students. My newest colleague, Hepburn, has a hundred and fifteen. At this age in our society, all children need help. Of course. Bowden mashed his cigarette brutally into the ashtray and folded his hands once more. Sometimes bad problems get by us. Home, environment, and drugs are the two most common. At least Todd isn't mixed up with speed or mescaline or PCP. God forbid. Sometimes, Rubberhead went on, there's simply nothing we can do. It's depressing, but it's a fact of life. Usually the ones that are first to get spit out of the machine we're running here are the class troublemakers, the sullen, uncommunicative kids, the ones who refuse to even try. They are simply warm bodies waiting for the system to buck them up through the grades or waiting to get old enough so they can quit without their parents' permission and join the army or get a job at the speedy boy car wash or marry their boyfriends. You understand, I'm being blunt. Our system is, as they say, not all it's cracked up to be. I appreciate your frankness. But it hurts when you see the machine starting to mash up someone like Todd. He ran out a 92 average for last year's work, and that puts him in the 95th percentile. His English averages are even better. He shows a flair for writing, and that's something special in a generation of kids that think culture begins in front of the TV and ends in the neighborhood movie theater. I was talking to the woman who had Todd in comp last year. She said Todd passed in the finest term paper she'd seen in 20 years of teaching. It was on the German death camps during World War II. She gave him the only A-plus she's ever given a composition student. I have read it, Bowden said. It is very fine. He has also demonstrated above-average ability in the life sciences and social sciences. And while he's not going to be one of the great math whizzes of the century, all the notes I have indicate that he's given it the good old college try. Until this year. Until this year. That's the whole story, in a nutshell. Yes. I'd hate like hell to see Todd go down the tubes this way, Mr. Bowden. And summer school... Well, I said I'd be frank. Summer school often does a boy like Todd more harm than good. Your usual junior high school summer session is a zoo. All the monkeys and the laughing hyenas are in attendance, plus a full complement of dodo birds. Bad company for a boy like Todd. Certainly. So, let's get to the bottom line, shall we? I suggest a series of appointments for Mr. and Mrs. Bowden at the counseling center downtown. Everything in confidence, of course. The man in charge down there, Harry Ackerman, is a good friend of mine. And I don't think Todd should go to them with the idea. I think you should. Rubber Ed smiled widely. Maybe we can get everybody back on track by June. It's not impossible. But Bowden looked positively alarmed by this idea. I believe they might resent the boy if I took that proposal to them now, he said. Things are very delicate. They could go either way. The boy has promised me he will work harder in his studies. He is very alarmed at the drop in his marks. He smiled thinly, a smile Ed French could not quite interpret. More alarm than you know. But, and they would resent me, Bowden pressed on quickly. God knows they would. Monica already regards me as something of a meddler. I try not to be, but you see the situation. I feel that things are best left alone for now. I've had a great deal of experience in these matters, Robert Ed told Bowden. 
He folded his hands on Todd's file and looked at the old man earnestly. I really think counseling is in order here. You'll understand that my interest in the marital problems your son and daughter-in-law are having begins and ends with the effect they're having on Todd. And right now they're having quite an effect. Let me make a counter-proposal, Bowden said. You have, I believe, a system of warning parents of poor grades. Yes, Rubber had agreed cautiously. Interpretation of progress cards, IOP cards. The kids, of course, call them flunk cards. They only get them if their grade in a given course falls below 78. In other words, we give out IOP cards to kids who are pulling a D or an F in a given course. Very good, Bowden said. Then what I suggest is this. If the boy gets one of those cards, even one, he held up one gnarled finger, I will approach my son and his wife about your counseling. I will go further. If the boy receives one of your flunk cards in April, we give them out in May, actually. Yes, if he receives one then, I guarantee that they will accept the counseling proposal. They are worried about their son, Mr. French, but now they are so wrapped up in their own problem that... He shrugged. I understand. So let us give them that long to solve their own problems. Pulling oneself up by one's own shoelaces, that is the American way, is it not? Yes, I guess it is, Rubber Ed told him after a moment's thought. And after a quick glance at the clock, which told him he had another appointment in five minutes. I'll accept that. He stood, and Bowden stood with him. They shook hands again, Rubber Ed being carefully mindful of the old party's arthritis. But in all fairness, I ought to tell you that very few students can pull out of an 18-week tailspin in just four weeks of classes. There's a huge amount of ground to be made up, a huge amount. I suspect you'll have to come through on your guarantee, Mr. Bowden. Bowden offered his thin, disconcerting smile again. Do you, was all he said. Something had troubled Rubber Ed through the entire interview, and he put his finger on it during lunch in the cafeteria more than an hour after Lord Peter had left, umbrella once again neatly tucked under his arm. He and Todd's grandfather had talked for fifteen minutes at least, probably closer to twenty, and Ed didn't think the old man had once referred to his grandson by name. Todd pedaled breathlessly up Dusander's walk and parked his bike on its kickstand. School had let out only fifteen minutes before. He took the front steps at one jump, used his door key, and hurried down the hall to the sunlit kitchen. His face was a mixture of hopeful sunshine and gloomy clouds. He stood in the kitchen doorway for a moment, his stomach and his vocal cords knotted, watching Dusander as he rocked with his cupful of bourbon in his lap. He was still dressed in his best, although he had pulled his tie down two inches and loosened the top button of his shirt. He looked at Todd expressionlessly, his lizard-like eyes at half-mast. Well, Todd finally managed. Dusander left him hanging a moment longer, a moment that seemed at least ten years long to Todd. Then, deliberately, Dusander set his cup on the table next to his bottle of ancient age and said, The fool believed everything. Todd let out his pent-up breath in a whooping gust of relief. Before he could draw another breath in, Dusander added, He wanted your poor, troubled parents to attend counseling sessions downtown with a friend of his. He was really quite insistent. Jesus! Did you... What did you... How, how did you handle it? I thought quickly, Dusander replied. Like the little girl in the Saki story, invention on short notice is one of my strong points. I promised him your parents would go in for such counseling if you received even one flunk card when they are given in May. The blood fell out of Todd's face. You did what? He nearly screamed. I've already flunked two algebra quizzes and a history test since the marking period started. He advanced into the room, his pale face now growing shiny with breaking sweat. There was a French quiz this afternoon, and I flunked that too. I know I did. All I could think about was that goddamn rubber head and whether or not you were taking care of him. You took care of him, all right, he finished bitterly. Not get one flunk, Todd? I'll probably get five or six. 
It was the best I could do without arousing suspicions, Dusander said. This French fool that he is is only doing his job. Now you will do yours. What's that supposed to mean? Todd's face was ugly and thunderous, his voice truculent. You will work. In the next four weeks, you will work harder than you have ever worked in your life. Furthermore, on Monday, you will go to each of your instructors and apologize them for your poor showing thus far. You will... It's impossible, Todd said. You don't get it, man. It's impossible. I'm at least five weeks behind in science and history. In algebra, it's more like ten. Nevertheless, Dusander said. He poured more bourbon. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? Todd shouted at him. Well, I don't take orders from you. The days when you gave orders are long over. Do you get it? He lowered his voice abruptly. The most lethal thing you've got around the house these days is a shell no pest strip. You're nothing but a broken down old man who farts rotten eggs if he eats a taco. I bet you even pee in your bed. Listen to me, snot nose, Dusander said quietly. Todd's head jerked angrily around at that. Before today, Dusander said carefully, it was possible, just barely possible, that you could have denounced me and come out clean yourself. I don't believe you would have been up to the job with your nerves in their present state, but never mind that. It would have been technically possible. But now things have changed. Today I impersonated your grandfather, one Victor Bowden. No one can have the slightest doubt that I did it with, how is the word, your connivance. If it comes out now, boy, you will look blacker than ever, and you will have no defense. I took care of that today. Oh, you wish, you wish, you wish, Dusander roared. Never mind your wishes. Your wishes make me sick. Your wishes are no more than little piles of dog shit in the gutter. All I want from you is to know if you understand the situation we are in. I understand it, Todd muttered. His fists had been tightly clenched while Dusander shouted at him. He was not used to being shouted at. Now he opened his hands and dully observed that he had dug bleeding half-moons into his palms. The cuts would have been worse, he supposed, but in the last four months or so he had taken up biting his nails. Good. And you will make your sweet apologies and you will study. In your free time at school you will study. During your lunch hours, you will study. After school, you will come here and study, and on your weekends, you will come here and do more of the same. Not here, Todd said quickly. At home. No. At home, you will dawdle and daydream as you have all along. If you are here, I can stand over you if I have to and watch you. I can protect my own interests in this matter. I can quiz you. I can listen to your lessons. If I don't want to come here, you can't make me. Dusander drank. That is true. Things will then go on as they have. You will fail. This guidance person, French, will expect me to make good on my promise. When I don't, he will call your parents. They will find out that kindly Mr. Denker impersonated your grandfather at your request. They will find out about the altered grades. They, oh, shut up, I'll come. You're already here. Begin with algebra. No way! It's Friday afternoon. You study every afternoon now, Dusander said softly. Begin with algebra. Todd stared at him, only for a moment, before dropping his eyes and fumbling his algebra text out of his book bag. And Dusander saw murder in the boy's eyes. Not figurative murder, literal murder. It had been years since he had seen that dark, burning, speculative glance, but one never forgot it. He supposed he would have seen it in his own eyes if there had been a mirror at hand on the day he had looked at the white and defenseless nape of the boy's neck. I must protect myself, he thought with some amazement. One underestimates at one's own risk. He drank his bourbon and rocked and watched the boys study.
It was nearly five o'clock when Todd biked home. He felt washed out, hot-eyed, drained, impotently angry. Every time his eyes had wandered from the printed page, from the maddening, incomprehensible, fucking stupid world of sets, subsets, ordered pairs, and Cartesian coordinates, Dusander's sharp old man's voice had spoken. Otherwise, he had remained completely silent, except for the maddening bump of his slippers on the floor and the squeak of the rocker. He sat there like a vulture waiting for its prey to expire. Why had he ever gotten into this? How had he gotten into it? This was a mess, a terrible mess. He had picked up some ground this afternoon, some of the set theory that had stumped him so badly just before the Christmas break had fallen into place with an almost audible click. But it was impossible to think he could pick up enough to scrape through next week's algebra test with even a D. It was four weeks until the end of the world. Some of the warmth had gone out of the day, and the air felt almost chilly. He supposed his friends had spent the afternoon goofing off down at the Babe Ruth Diamond on Walnut Street, maybe playing a little scrub, more likely playing pepper or three-fly six-grounders or roly bat. It was the time of the year when you started working your way up to baseball. There was some talk about getting up their own sandlot team this year to compete in the informal city league. There were dads enough willing to schlep them around to games. Todd, of course, would pitch. He had been a little league pitching star until he had grown out of the senior little league division last year. Would have pitched. So what? He'd just have to tell them no. He'd just have to tell them... Uh, Guys, I got mixed up with this war criminal. I got him right by the balls, and then, (laughs) this'll kill you guys, then I found out he was holding my balls as tight as I was holding his. I started having funny dreams and the cold sweats. My grades went to hell, and I changed them on my report card so my folks wouldn't find out. And now I've got to hit the books really hard for the first time in my life. I'm not afraid of getting grounded, though. I'm afraid of going to the reformatory. And that's why I can't play any sandlot with you guys this year. You see how it is, guys. A thin smile, much like Dusander's, and not at all like his former broad grin, touched his lips. There was no sunshine in it. It was a shady smile. There was no fun in it, no confidence. It merely said, You see how it is, guys. You see how it is, 